All right, hello everybody. So today we have a special guest, Daniel Baruta, who is the FEMA, um, someone who is in FEMA and also he was a site coordinator of uh, a super voting center in Washington, DC. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a second. This is the episode, second episode of, of my book release. Um, it's, the book is currently still at the printers and we're patiently waiting all these wonderful paintings to be in your hands very soon. And today we're gonna to cover voting and vaccines. And we're gonna split the talk up today into two sections. So the first is covering what it was like to be in Washington DC, witnessing people inside of voting centers and inside of um, doing different types of voting and participating in democracy. And the second part, we're gonna cover how the United States government is distributing vaccines to the public. And my name, I'm Eddie Sue. I painted all the paintings inside of the book and also um, came up with the idea. And my friend, Alex Chu, he's on with us today as well. Hello everybody. And, and he helped me write, he helped me take photographs and, and videos and just really awesome shots and helped me brainstorm ideas to get this project up and going. So we're super excited to have you on board. Uh, we're gonna quickly tell you about episode three, the last and final episode of the book releases. This will be covering artivism, which is a term for activist art mixed together. And the focus will be on the protests and protest art in Washington DC during the 2020 election. We have tons of photos and lots of paintings. I would say that the book is healthily, um, it's really healthily split between the voting process, democratic process, and then the protests. The celebra and perhaps like the celebrations of the election would be the last component of this, of this book. So please mark your calendars sometime in, in mid to late February. Uh, this is the last and final episode and working really hard to uh, get this up and going because we have three speakers that day, three women who have been at the White House fence for months. They were there for months and doing, um, creating posters and creating artwork and creating lots of wonderful, wonderful um, protest art. So please join us for that when it comes up. This is the book and we're gonna dive right in. Alex and I came up with this, uh, this idea over the phone. Alex called me, he was just like, what did you say, Alex? Well, I mean, it's a backstory. Like we've known each other for five years, five, six years. We've been good friends. Right. And I've seen your art for years. So I knew you were really good. And I just called you and I said, Hey, we had to, we, we, I had just come down to San Francisco where you were. I live in Seattle right now. And we just said, Hey, you know, I've seen your art. You were talking about going there, but you weren't sure. And I just said, one day I just said, you know what, what else have we got going on? It's September. The election is in November. You know, let's, it'll be fun. Let's document it. And so it was just started with a phone call. And next thing we know, we like flew down there. So it's pretty amazing. Right. Alex and I went to protests over the summer as well. This is us at, um, he, well, he's in Seattle and I'm in California. And we went to our own respective um, human rights uh, protests. And I was painting at these and got me prepared for what it was like to be in Washington DC during this past election because it was also very chaotic and also very um, potentially dangerous. And Alex, he also has um, marched as well. And I've I spoke to him about the potential dangers and the, the importance of the project as well. Like he really emphasized that to me and I felt it and, I, and we just fueled each other in terms of what we wanted to move forward, how, how we wanted to move forward with this project. 
So we flew all the way across the nation to Washington, D.C. And that's where we met Daniel. And <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I feel so honored to be asked by Eddie and Alex to be part of this presentation. So I just really hope that people find it helpful. So I uh, was like is before, sorry, Dan, you're cutting you off. You know, when me and Ed started this project, we had no clue that you can actually go in there to, you know, to a voting center without, you know, even voting, right? You know, we're not, we're not <laughs> residents of Washington, D.C. So I said, Ed, you know, maybe you can, you know, you can draw people outside waiting in lines. Maybe you can, you know, you know, see uh, security guards or something like that. Like what protests are going on at the voting center. But, you know, thanks to Daniel, you know, we were able to get access to our first, you know, at the Washington Capitals, um, a Capital One Center. That's what it's called, right? And Correct. through through Daniel, he kind of started it. And then, you know, Ed got comfortable. We started asking other people to go into their uh voting centers and documenting it so and it's Daniel was a great help help to us we we always relied on him I think most we went there a lot of times to your voting center so thank, thank you but first me and I would like to thank you for like being a part of this project and helping us so oh great. absolutely I'm so excited I can't wait to get my copy of the book <laughs> yeah I want to say like I I want to say that you were part of the reason why this book is possible because of the confidence that was built by being able to ask other site coordinators to f do this project inside of these voting centers, but norm because normally you can't just walk in there. And um, we weren't, we didn't have like official press badges and official media badges. We were just working on this project. Correct. And I, uh, I remember the day that uh, Eddie walked up to us at the Capital One Center. It's our big sports center where the our, our two our men's, women's, and uh, men's team and women's team and basketball team uh, play and our hockey team plays. And we were able to get the sports center because during COVID, none of those activities were were happening. So we were really lucked out to actually get get it as a super site. But one thing that was mentioned on the first call that we had a few weeks ago with Eddie, uh, a woman named Joyce really hit, hit it on the head when she said, I can tell by looking at your pictures, you two have a lot of integrity. And when I met Eddie and Alex, that really jumped out at me. And the more I heard about their story of them raising money, coming across the country at a very dangerous time with COVID, with the protests, seeing them out there every day, what they did, they visited all eight wards, uh, and when Eddie pulled out his little palette of the, um, I'm sure he'll talk about it later, of the uh, of his colors in the little Altoid box. Right, I'm going to share that right now. Yeah, so this is the tools that I use to paint with, and this is includes... Tools the, of the trade. Um, tools of the trade. Right. So this is uh, water pens that contain water inside of them already, and they have a brush <laughs> tip. That's the late so house one. <laughs> I have... I have waterproof ink pens. So these lines are drawn first with waterproof ink. That way, all the gesture, all the movement, all the moment can be captured first. And if the person moves and changes angle, I can still capture their color and their patterns um, when they move. This is what I've made myself with an Altoids mini tin and all the colors that are in here, all these watercolors in here are what I use to uh, paint the entire see all these scenes all the people that you saw well and, and, and i think and it's important to to say is like you know eddie's not telling these people stand still i'm gonna draw you this is all spur of the moment in live you know eddie's just painting while people are doing their natural thing there's no excuse me sir can you stand this way and you know this is not photography this is live painting so this is a very special skill that he has and that's what I was when I, I was first blown away by this. And I'm sure Daniel was too. It's like, you're just, you're just painting. Like, you know, a lot of it is just your work. You know, no one is, you know, posing or anything like that. So I just want to let, you know, our audience know who hasn't joined us for the first episode. That's all. Well, and just one, one, one final note before we move to the next slide. I, I'm a social worker by trade. So I'm a pretty good judge of people. And um, <laughs> to see two young people really get involved in the election really gave me a lot of hope. I know a lot of people, especially this year, this past year, are, are kind of jaded on the elections, whether they were, you know, whether they were truthful or not. But
But I can tell you as, as election workers, and I've been an election worker a long time, we really, really, really try to do our best to make sure everybody votes fairly and securely. And to see these two young people gave me a lot of hope for the future of our elections in this country. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so people might not know too much about you, but I, Alex and I learned a little bit about you recently, and we're just so impressed by the amount of work and coordination that you've done before. So please tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. Oh, well, <laughs> well, I've, um, I've been uh, in federal service now for 32 years. I'm pretty proud of that. I really love being a public servant and I take it very seriously. Uh, before I got the job at FEMA, Actually, I worked at AmeriCorps, and before that, I worked at the Peace Corps. And before that, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. But anyway, these are shots from my Peace Corps, uh, from my AmeriCorps days. The first one over in the left is uh, me doing mold remediation on a home in South Carolina during Hurricane Joaquin. Uh, it's a lot of work. You have to take all the, the drywall out. You have to scrub down all the, the two by fours and the, the structure, and then you have to put on that white paint and let it dry, and then you can put back the the, uh, the 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 walling. But it's it's a lot of work, and you can see I'm standing on a pile of stuff that we had to take out. The next one is also a picture from South Carolina. This is our more recent during Hurricane Florence. Our AmeriCorps members were in this gentleman's house, mucking and gutting. And then the third picture. These are all young people, uh, ages 18 to 25, in our AmeriCorps Young People's Program. They came from all over the country to help work. Uh, uh, based in Austin, but they were down on the Gulf Coast working Hurricane Harvey in 2017. It was just an awesome, awesome experience for all of us. And I was lucky to be one of the coordinators down there. I spent about six weeks down in, in Austin helping coordinate. But I'm um, really grateful to all the AmeriCorps members, all the Peace Corps people who have brought peace around the world. And um, yeah, it's, I've been a pretty lucky guy in terms of my job assignments. And now I'm at FEMA, but we'll talk about that a little bit later, I think. So nice. you know, you know, we're you know we're lucky to meet you because your it seems like your life has been predicated on service that you've just been going around helping people and you know, I think once we we go through the art, you know, you'll see that the book is like a hopeful book. It's a hopeful book. It's a it's a book about you know what the people that are volunteering and you're gonna get to that. But that's great that you know you're telling us about all the AmeriCorps volunteers because you know. If you were to ask me about it, I would think there's like 10 people, but there's a lot of people who cared. And that's something I got out of DC was that, you know, there's a lot of people who care and a lot of good people. So, Absolutely. you know, everything you see on the news is one episode, but there's stuff that doesn't get talked about. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So Daniel also volunteers with uh, the voting process. So yeah, this is him <laughs> and his crews, crews, multiple. So here's a little, so um, yeah, I, I started out as a ballot clerk in 2004 at my local precinct up the street. It's uh, the basement of the Presbyterian Church. If you're from DC, it's at 15th and R. We have about 145 precincts throughout the eight wards. And usually um, my crew, well, and then in 2008, I became a precinct captain. The picture you see with me in the red vest on the top, that's the number of crew I usually have for a general election or a citywide election. This was June of 2018 when we had the election for mayor. So uh, this is an important contrast because the picture right below it with all those folks, this is what we had at the Capital One Center at the mega site, the super site, trying to get everyone to vote. And I, I know you can't see it too well, but there's a real distinction between the two pictures. The one on top, most of the folks are uh, baby boomers are older. The ones on the bottom, we had about, I'd say about 60% of our crew were under the age of 40. And again, this was huge. Um, the, the Board of Elections had a hard time recruiting older people like they normally do during the COVID experience for both the June election and the general election. But young people came out of the woodwork and really put in a great effort. And I just really hope that they come back and work with us. I think later on in the presentation, you'll see pictures of Eddie with some young folks. I just wanna reiterate that at the end, but these two pictures show the contrast, the before and after. And uh, the picture up on the left, 
we were there on Halloween. So we kind of, uh, I brought some cowboy hats in and some funny hats and we kind of dressed up on Halloween to give the voters a little bit of a, a chuckle as they came through our center, but we had a lot of fun. And then of course we took pictures and, you know, we just love uh, being the center of attention. Yeah, it looks really fun there. I remember going into the voting center and uh, it was the first one that I went to and uh, just met Daniel and saw how he took care of his crew. And that was really great. And quick mention, if any of you have questions about what is going on or concerns about how voting works and the vaccines, please type those questions inside the comment box. We'll get make sure that they get to Daniel. That's uh, through certain breaks in the in the presentation. Awesome. All right, so we're going to jump right in. Democracy in action. We had when I was arrived, I started painting right away because the voting had already started. Early voting, and this was almost yes. It says there right there six days before the election, and on the very left is like a voting drop box. And, Correct. and you also see um, when I went to the Capital One Sports Center, that's where I was painting some election workers outside and I wasn't quite sure if I was even allowed to do that outside. And then I asked them, hey, you know, can I just see what it's like inside, at least get some type of understanding of how what, what kind of the lighting it looks like or what kind of how things are structured and then is there a daniel just in, fa yeah fast forward and like daniel just it was like do this project <laughs> and i was like <laughs> awesome awesome this is like what we came for and then i was so excited to tell alex about it and because there's so many different ways of voting i'm going to let daniel speak more about that because he has a lot more experience well, thank you, uh, Eddie. So, uh, yeah, uh, two main things for the Board of Edu Board of Elections. Everyone who wants to vote should vote, and everyone who wants to vote should vote safely. So, uh, after the primary, we learned a lot from the primary, uh, where we did not send out ballots to everybody. And on primary day, in, in D.C., it was June 3rd, we had thousands of people show up at, at, at the polling places we set up and people had to wait four hours in line. So the DC board went back to the back to the basics and mailed out ballots to everybody this time. So it was quite an experience and the board did a great job in a very, uh, in a very small amount of time to recalibre uh, and really get everybody out there a, a chance to vote. So you'll see people dropping off the boxes in these boxes. These boxes are spread throughout the city and then the board, somebody from the board would collect the, the, uh, the drop in the, the, the ballots at the end of each night and bring them downtown. So this was new for DC this year, it was drop boxes and voting by mail. It's never, it hasn't happened before. You had to go to previous years, you had to go to building centers or the, 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 the primary that you just had before. Well, usually uh, if, I'm, if I get my stats correct, and I think I do, we usually mail out about 30,000 um, absentee ballots right. for, during a general election. Uh, and then for the primary, it kind of went up because of COVID, it went up to about 90,000, but that wasn't enough because a lot of people showed up to vote. So then that's when the board decided, hey, we've got to do an all out effort and get everybody a ballot, whether, they, whether they've asked for one or not. How long was the wait outside of some of these during the primary? Well, it's funny. I'm glad you asked that, Eddie, because during the primary, we had um, early voting for about 10 days before the actual election. And the voting, the turnouts during the 10 days was, was dismal. We had, one day we had 27 people. One day we had 50 people. I think the day before the election, we had 150 people. And then the day of the election, we had over a thousand people. And like I said, the last person wow. in line at eight o'clock was allowed to vote, and that person voted at midnight. And this is the <laughs> primary between for the Democratic primary, right? Between Biden and Sanders and, and Warren, right? Well, uh, the district is kind of an anomaly. It's mostly about ninety five percent Democratic. Right. So, uh, <laughs> but there were things on the ballot that people could vote for. But again, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a major contest. But uh, for the 
for the general election, it was the exact opposite. The first day we opened up, I don't think you guys were in town yet. We had about 1500 voters go through the Capitol One Center. And then it dwindled, it, it, it dwindled down after that. I think the next day was 900, then through 450, then 350. And then the day of the election, I think we processed close to 600 voters, but everybody, there was no wait. People walked in the first day, there was maybe a 25 minute wait when we had the 1500, um, but it was the exact opposite of what happened in the primary. So a lot of people did turn in their ballots uh, through the US mail or they came into the Capital One Center and dropped them off in one of our drop boxes we had inside. Great. Right. Yeah. So this this is a look inside of the voting center at that point when I was allowed in. We have registration and check-in on the left. I decided to paint as much of the process as possible. The ballot clerk asked if you want paper or electronic on, on the upper left. You'll see over there she's directing individuals to either the paper or electronics uh, corridor or the side of, side of the hallway. And I started immediately with the electronic voting machines because that was somewhat new to me because I hadn't seen these machines. Uh, two years ago, I voted from, with by mail as well. And I remember asking Daniel that, and he told me that these machines were about only about two years old. Is that right? Yeah, well, yeah, we had, uh, in the past, we had ones, yeah, it's kind of, I don't want to get in too much detail because well, I could talk forever sure. on it, but in the past, those machines, the older machines we had of those actually counted the votes on a spool that was in the back. Hmm. People were upset about that because they weren't, they didn't feel comfortable with that. So we got rid of the machines with the spools and those machines you see in the pictures just literally mark a paper ballot that people insert. You'll see, there it is. See on, on the left-hand side, left. you'll see mm -hmm. a, a ballot clerk holding the ballot, the voter getting ready to vote. Once the, the gentleman puts the ballot inside the, the marking device, the, the voter votes and then the ballot comes out printed and the person can read exactly who they voted for. And then they walk the ballot down the hallway and we'll see a schematic of that later mm -hmm. and insert it into the machine that actually counts the ballots. Also um, into that same machine goes the regular ballots that people can fill in with, uh, with pen and ink like they normally do. They fill in the bubble right there in the center, right, but we'll, right. we'll show pictures of that. And also one more thing, Eddie, um, again, to emphasize that everybody votes here in DC, you can register and vote the same day if you meet the residency requirements. So again, uh, it's really important that even if they mail in their ballots, a, a person moving into the district within the last six months can come into a voting center and register and vote the same day. So to clarify, I hope like ease people's minds. So these electronic voting machines, they're not submitting the vote for you directly, right? So Correct. as they're you said, they, they're the printing ballot. it onto that long piece of paper that we see on the on um, in, in, the, in gentlemen's hands on the left. Yeah, some people prefer doing it electronically. Some people prefer doing it, you know, a pen on paper, the old fashioned Got it. way. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing here on the left. Correct. That these booths are what, you're tra what you traditionally expect out of a uh, voting um, uh, experience before Correct. electronic voting, I see. And on the lower left there, each individual who's registered gets a personalized paper ballot printed for them before they even enter any um, um, of their votes. And I wanted to emphasize that the types of individuals that we saw through the uh, the voted these voting centers, the one that one that really struck out stuck out to me that day was uh, this elderly woman who was barely able to walk on her cane. She could barely walk. She had to have a election worker help her walk. Cause this is a long hallway. And just to see her with that resilience and that drive to participate in the democratic process, that was really touching. I, I had to paint that. I gave her a prominent um, place inside of this page right here. As you can see, she, she's the main focus in this uh, in this spread, 
one other one other anecdote uh, that blew me away. Uh, I think it was during on election day. One of my uh, check-in clerks said, "You've got to come over here. See that gentleman that is now walking down the hall with his ballot. He's uh, 59 years old. He's uh, an American citizen from birth, and he's voting for the very first time." <laughs> And it blew me away. I just kept thinking. I mean, when I was 18, I couldn't wait to vote. <laughs> I was chomping at the bit. But I kept thinking, how many presidents, how many senators, how many local initiatives has this person missed? But he's here today, and that's important, and we're here for him, and God bless him. He voted for the first time in his life, and he'll probably never forget it. <laughs> that's awesome. It tells you the stakes of what's, what, what was at stake, you know, in this election with the people who, you know, why, why all of a sudden he felt the need to. So, and that's why yeah. we, that's why we were down there. Yep. Yeah, this, uh, you got it. The stakes being in, in this, the, Ruth Ginsburg passed away not so long ago and uh, Amy Barrett was assigned a lifetime seat um, through the president Trump at the time. And the Senate, and even though the Electoral College eventually is the final vote on who becomes president, we do have control over who we put in the Senate. So, people who say that voting doesn't matter, like they sometimes don't understand what kind of consequences there really are. And so Daniel, I want to ask mm -hmm. you: Is that you know what? Ha like you know, as someone who worked in these voting centers. What did, how did you feel when all this fraud of the last guy who was talking about all the rumors that's all over the news? How, how did you feel as someone who's, you know, you're involved, you're, you're as involved as anyone in this process of, you know, voting and, you know, and, and how, how votes are counted? Like, how did that make you feel like? Well, I suppose it ranged from angry to disheartened, back to angry to disheartened. <laughs> we try so hard. And the, what really got me was uh, after when I was watching the folks in Virginia and Pennsylvania doing the recounts, yeah, yeah. the amount of hours. Yeah, they're working all hours. night, they're working all night to get it, to get some, to get you a, 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 a 24 hours uh, with people watching over them. You know, every little thing they dropped on the floor was, you know, they could have said was voter fraud. Those people, <laughs> we are dedicated workers. We take it seriously. And it just was very disheartening. But you knew in your, what they were claiming was impossible because you know how secure what you were doing was every, every night, right? You would tell oh, yeah. no, I mean, yes, we be coming and getting these pamphlets out, right? Every night. Oh yeah, no, we, we, we ran a tight ship. I mean, I, I, again, we had a great crew. We had young people, we had uh, veteran people, you know, people that had done it before. Everyone got along, everyone showed up for their shifts. I was very impressed. So, but uh, this is the picture of, this is the machine that actually counts the vote. You can see this person um, uh, putting her, her, putting his or her vote in, into, th or, they, or they, or their vote into the machine. Uh, both the, the, the big paper ballot and the, the electronic marking paper ballot goes into these machines. And then the, 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 the paper is stored in the, in the bottom. At the end of the night, and I wish Eddie and Alex had stuck around to see this, we pull out all the paper ballots. Uh, they're in a big bin. We lock them up right away. Uh, they're brought downtown as backup. But we uh, Bluetooth the uh, electronic results immediately as soon as we close the polls. Well, within about 15 minutes, we electronically send the, the, the tallies downtown so that we can tally the votes quickly for the media and the, the rest of the people that are very interested in the results. And we had five of these. Usually in, a, in my local precinct up the street, we have one machine. We had five of them here at the Capital One Center. And over on the left, you'll see Eddie's map of the center. The, the, we went down the whole hallway. So you came in on 6th Street and you kept going and, and you exited on 7th Street. And I have never seen uh, a, a precinct that is one city block long. Right, yeah. But it was great because by going, by keeping the flow going steadily down, there was no backtracking and it was safer for people instead of having to have people come back and forth. Right. Or going come, come into the same exit, right? You know, the same. Yeah. Door. 
again, safety was a big deal. And uh, I think Eddie has a picture somewhere of a gentleman cleaning the, the machines in another ward, which he'll talk about later. But we really tried to make it as safe as possible. Right. And, and, and that's why we wanted to document it, um, you know, this election, because no one, none of us has voted during a pandemic. And during this slide right here, this is Doc 5. This is the next day. I think, Eddie, which day is it Saturday or is it Sunday? Sunday before the election. And we're, we're at here and we can see that, you know, another, another voting, station, uh, vote, voting station where people are coming up. This one was really festive in, in the sense that they had people cheering every time, anytime a uh, child or a new resident from DC, to DC or, uh, you know, or uh, first time voter. You know, it was just a very festive atmosphere. All the voter, all the volunteers would cheer. And, you know, again, like, you know, and during the pandemic, we had people, you know, the person on the right is like wiping down the doorways, like he's wiping down every single electronic machine, every single paper ballot, every desk doorknob. He's, he's doing everything to make sure it's safe that people come here and feel comfortable. Because, you know, we're, I mean, as we are right now, the life is a lot different than what it normally is for a normal election. And so I, I really like this slide. Um, the man on the bottom on the left says ASL interpreter. You know, you could you could vote if you had, if you didn't know if you didn't know how to if you were deaf. You know, there's a, a sign language person. I don't know ASL interpreter, so he could help you with the ballots. So Spanish, English, and you can and sign language. So it's pretty amazing. The if you didn't know English, you can still vote in certain ways. So yeah, I was real, I love this site. What's your thoughts, Ed? I thought that you spoke I, I was really glad that you spoke to these individuals because I while I was painting these individuals having the story behind them was really important for this book and over there on the right these families that came with their kids to vote and demonstrating and showing them how to participate in the democratic process and having the whole site just cheer like people who have not voted before or don't go into these voting centers, they don't understand what kind of a production this involves, like the type of security that's involved, the coordination, the people that have set up these machines and, and take care of everything and clean everything every day. It's, it's a lot of work. So it's an important part of what we have in our democracy to be, have these luxuries and have these abilities to do this. So we should be proud of what we have. Right, and it's like, you know, it's, that's, the, that's the picture of, uh, oh, yeah, that's the picture of the voting center that, that, that Ed uh, uh, painted. And what, what right, we waited. From Howard. We waited until there was less people for this shot, yeah. Um, like I had mentioned before, there isn't much uh, access to these because of the security reasons. Um, but because of this project, people were more willing to be to, to contribute and cooperate. With, and we were just really lucky to have a lot of these images. Um, yeah, Alex mentioned that this is at Howard University. Um, girl who, and Kamala Harris went to Howard University, the new vice president. And as you see on the upper left, she's holding the pages of the paintings in her hands. And you'll notice that the book pages also have uh, the hands of people in DC holding the books in their hands. So, yeah, did you wanna add something to this, Daniel? No, I was just gonna say the, uh, when, uh, when Alex was talking about the interpreter, the ASL interpreter, mm -hmm. we also had an iPad, each uh, polling place had an iPad and uh, with a direct access to over 16 languages where uh, oh, wow. we, had a, we had a Vietnamese family come in, I think uh, not the day of the election, the day before, and they really needed translation help. On that iPad, they were able to speak directly with, with a Vietnamese uh, bilingual <laughs> person who uh, we had to register the, the father. The mother was registered, but the father wasn't registered. It took a little bit of extra time, but I was so impressed that we were able to help them too and um, yeah, it was just another way. So, of, was, um, so there was a live translator on the other side um, yep. through the screen. Oh, wow. Okay. On that's, the iPad. That's really cool. That's really cool. I know. And that wouldn't have happened a couple of years ago. <laughs>
Yeah, so Alex and I went to all different spots. We went to the Everyone Washington Nationals ballpark. Every vote count, right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Uh, yeah, so at the ballpark, they set up another voting center. It's a super voting center. And what that means is that anybody from all, any of the eight wards in Washington, D.C. can come vote at these super voting centers. Traditionally, when in thin your ward, you're only allowed to vote in your ward. But the super voting center made it so much easier for people who are probably working and just commuting and couldn't get back in time. They could just pop into the, one of these super voting centers and, and get get it done. What did you think of this ballpark, Alex? I remember like we were well, really I excited mean, to go in, that, but that ballpark I actually been to because I've watched a baseball game there. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Nats, go Nats. You know? Yeah, I, I was really excited to actually be in a baseball stadium. I was like, wow, this is like, it's pretty cool. You know, the intersection of voting and, you know, I, that was the one center that I think all the young people, they were like, we didn't meet any old volunteers. Like everyone, everyone in that, I didn't even psych corner was under 40. Cause that was nice. I think everyone, that that was the place to be, and they had amazing food there. We actually met a volunteer there, you know, just to show you the last picture. I we asked I asked her I said why why do you want to volunteer here? Like you know, there's this pandemic, and she she mentioned it. She was like she remembered as a as a kid, you know, her mom taking her to the voting booth, and you know that's how things get started. You know, she was a kid at the voting booth, and now she's volunteering. So you know, I mean, I don't have kids, but you know. <laughs> You know, if I had one, I would bring them, bring them there. That's how you, you know, you get them started. And I'm sure, like the people who volunteer, they're gonna, you know, because they're so young, they're gonna keep doing it. Like I don't see them stopping. Like they were pretty even. I mean, it's hard work standing there for hours on end. So, you know, as, as you can see here, you, you got a lot of picture. This is like, this is Washington D.C. University, another university in the gymnasium, and you know, we had another, uh, you know, same machines big site you know the site coordinator here was really cool too he was i forgot his name what was his name ross that's what his name was ross mm -hmm. and he was just a retired federal worker and he was i think he was in his 60s and he's like you know volunteering you know volunteering because it's a civic duty and he's just like i he, he had a wife and he said he rents up he was renting a hotel to stay in just so she wouldn't get her just so you know he would be doing his job and not getting him sick so that's how much it meant for him to be able to like, you know, volunteer for this job. So I, I was shocked. I was like, wait, you're actually losing money doing this. You know, you're actually paying for a hotel to like, you know, to like make sure this, this work gets done. So it was very inspirational for me when I was, when I was at this site. Right. A lot of these sites were held inside of basketball gyms. This is the one that was, that we just saw. And this is another one from another angle. This is where, uh, the location had a second floor that you could look down on Ooh. the different voting booths uh, and the Columbia Heights. We went to all eight wards bef um, up until uh, and election day. So this was ward one, the one before was ward three. So Alex and I went uh, quite a distance to get all these different locations into the book. This is uh, me from a certain angle from above looking down and this is some actual painting going on. Um, we got in trouble. They, they didn't like us uh, up there looking down on everybody. Mm -hmm. So we were told to get out. <laughs> so we were actually kicked out of this one, you know, but these guys are nice. They, I mean, they, they, just, Halfway. They, didn't like us, they didn't like us like looking down on people. And I get it. You know, people are voting. Yeah. They don't you know no, no guys looking down on them. So. I mean, we got the painting done. Right, right. Got, <laughs> it, got, it got done before we really got in trouble. So. <laughs> yeah, election day, election day, we went to three wards all at once because we that we wanted to check them all off, and we started with ward four around the area that we were staying at at the time, and there was curbside voting, which I had never seen before. So we had uh, drop it, um, drop off boxes, we had mail in ballots, we had people voting in person and then curbside voting is when people can just drive up in their car and then get handed an iPad to get registered and then they get a ballot they vote from their car you don't you don't feel safe enough to get out of your car they, they you can vote in your car which is pretty crazy you know that's amazing kind of like shock I was like whoa this guy just uh, yeah it's it was nuts it's a little it's a lot more work for the poll worker but we're happy to do it 
So there's a, if you want to go back one slide, one, one slide, Ed, um, a great uh, sure. a story on this, on this story was the guy on the left, green, he's all working green. The guy is Mr. His name is called Mr. Henry, 73 years old. So you got, you got some work, you got, you still got more time to do it, but he was 73 and he was volunteering. He's not even voting. He's volunteering. He's like marching up and down the stairwell in this, of this school, just trying to get people to vote. And uh, he was, I was like, what, what? And we talk about it in the book. I was like, why are you doing this? You know, you're 73. You know, there's no vaccine yet. It is November. There's no vaccine. There's nothing, you know, like what you could, this could, this could be your life. And he was just like, you know, I'm a patriot and he's bored as hell. So he was out there. He was out there at 73. So, you know, he still got some more years than you, Daniel. Hey, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> See this gray hair? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And there is all different kinds of volunteers. And in this case, Lauren, she had purple hair. She was a bartender last uh, four years ago during the last presidential election. And when all that went down, she was just like, all right, they're asking for help for this election. And she doesn't want to see all that same stuff happen again. And she decided to come out and, and volunteer. And I had her hold the book for one of the pages as well. Wait, uh, one, one quick point. Even yep. if you live in a state that has all mail-in ballots like Washington and Oregon, you probably could still volunteer to help count those um, those ballots coming in in mail. I mean, again, looking at Georgia and, and uh, Pennsylvania, those <laughs> folks worked like heck after the election counting. So right. just because you don't have in-person voting in your in your uh, jurisdiction doesn't mean you can't get involved. Right. You can be a teller. You can be a teller. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think it was Trevor Noah that had to put out a call for younger um, volunteers and just a lot of young people came out this year. Right, Daniel? Yep. And we don't know what I'm here. I'm in the district. I'm chomping at the bit to hear from the Board of Elections to see what our next election is going to be like. So it went so well with uh, all mail uh, voting, you know, all you know, the ballots being mailed to everybody. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but regardless, uh, it's really a, it's a community effort and a very important one. Right, <clears throat> we went to um, Ward Seven, which is much more rundown. It was a really rundown elementary school, and then we went to like a really nice high school, the brand new Blue High, Blue Senior High. Yeah, this was a great school. I, I really loved it. There was just you know enthusiasm. This is election day. So, you know, they probably, these people have been like, you know, you can do early bowling a week ahead of time. But every time a car pulled up to this high school, and which was the nicest high school I've ever been to in my life, <laughs> uh, cheering, dancing, music was playing. Uh, it was just so festive there. It just made it, you know, I was so excited, you know, to be there. And, you know, they weren't just there for the free food. Like these people were volunteering, marching people to the voting station, another basketball court. But this was just such a fun place to be. And it was a brand new school. It was literally like five years old. And so, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a, you could see the neighborhood around it was not as nice as the school. Yeah, I could appreciate that there were live painters outside right. that mm -hmm. brought easels, brought paint. And this was happening at multiple voting centers that day. So I was speaking to some of the painters and they were just doing democratic or uh, yeah, just based off of democracy, any type of anything that encouraged people to get involved and vote. Uh, yeah, that was really awesome to see. So from there that evening, we were looking for a place yeah. to sell, uh, like just figure out what was going on with the results as they were coming in. And we didn't really know about any election parties because there was a pandemic going on. And normally there's tons of election parties during the presidential elections. But in this case, like Alex was just like, all right, well, you had heard about some, that someone mentioned some place, right? Then, yeah, we were, we went to the, um, so right after Bal Balao High School, we took a cab, we went straight to the National Ballpark and there's a bar, they said, everyone's going to be there. So, uh, you know, I said, Ed, you know, from talking to people for the last couple of days, they said, this is the bar to be in. We go into the bar, it's all red, red lights everywhere. And I didn't really think too much of it. I was just like, well, it's a bar. 
So then, like, we go in and Fox News is everywhere. And I'm just like, I asked the waitress, like, you know, aren't you going to listen to some other channels? And she's like, no, this is a Republican bar. So I was just like, I we didn't, we didn't know that going in, but, you know. But it was cool because that's like the one, they said this is the one bar in D.C. that's a Republican bar. This is where all the senator, Republican senators and congressmen go. So I was like, wow, Ed, uh, at least for me, I'm in enemy territory. So, you know, you could, you could hear a pin drop when I think Biden won like, you know, in Vermont or something like that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was fun. It was fun. I mean, we had, the, bar, the bartender was funny because she actually worked for Chuck Schumer, who's a Democratic senator. And she was like, well, I didn't know it was a Republican bar either. So if not, <laughs> she wouldn't have worked there. But she told us where to go next. So we went to a demo, we got, you know, we got a drink and then we went to a cab and, and went to a Democratic bar. And that was a totally different vibe. Well, the Red Derby, that's what it's called. Red Derby. And so, yeah, it was, uh, red- it was, a, it was a fun vibe. But, um, you know, yeah, the, the blue, you can see the blue. Yeah, that, we went to that bar. It was all blue colors. It was no red. It was <laughs> And, uh, you know, I mean, at this point, it's pretty late at night. It's like 1030. And, you know, Biden was losing. He was losing. And you could feel the tension in the room. People were crying. People were like hugging each other. They're like, I mean, not hugging, you know, but, you know, the the people who they came with, they were hugging, you know, because, you know, the election was a toss up at this point. You didn't know. It looked like Trump was going to win because he was like, you know, he was winning all the early votes in all the swing states. So, you know, we stuck around till 11 and... You know, it was a toss up at that night. You know, I, no one knew which way it would swing. So I think, I think the shocking thing was, you know, Biden, everyone talked about Biden was going to win by a landslide. And, you know, the early results did not show that. So, yeah. So, from we, as you can see, there's different maps that were done while the election results were coming in. And we didn't know who would win. Like this project had a lot of different things that could have happened. Alex put ourselves in really d- difficult, dangerous situations. Uh, if the results had swung another way, there could have been other people out there that weren't so friendly to our demographic. So we were glad f- that we were able to get this project done no matter what. And we're going to skip to another topic before the end of the hour it's the uh what what's been on people's minds for a while and i think it's important to start to start to address this because and luckily daniel when i met him i asked him you know where he also he said he was from frima as well and had done some work there and recently had he had spoken to me about working on distributing the the vaccine nationwide so that's that's pretty incredible and um, love to uh, just show you real quick about like just how the p- pandemic has affected our lives and this is a quick flip through of what all the paintings I did um, in spring and and summer of, of 2020 just like the social distancing the essential services that were open such as the post office that everybody was on on their phones talking to each other instead of in person uh, like testing stations getting set up just just so much was happening despite not a lot happening. And we had to just get adjusted to what was, uh, what was occurring as quickly as possible because, you know, who who knows how long this was going to go on for. And, you know, like Home Depot, people were remodeling their houses because there's nothing better to do. People were still gathering out in, in the grass. So it just, this book documents the different types of things that were going on, social distancing circles inside of parks, protests that were occurring, Grad, graduation, high school graduations and malls start to reopen. So this documents the progress of what was occurring. So in addition to the election book, I've, I've also worked on a book that's been documented the uh, spring and summer of 2020 and also uh, currently what's going on. This, this one is ongoing right now as we speak, but uh, mm. the fall and winter as things were open in the fall and as things started to close down again. So outdoors dining, for example, in our area, there were small like gatherings and uh, those started to close down as well. And I went to, this is, shows me going to Washington DC and coming back, uh, people getting tested again, Thanksgiving with a sandwich, 
Uh, you know, Christmas decorations are up. So life, as much as possible, people are trying to find some joy and semblance. And I documented as much of that as possible within this book. Also, um, like the, this is the where we are right now in this current period of time. And I'll show you that the vaccine is now currently being distributed in our local area. And this is inside of a, of a hospital. Um, this is the Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Mountain View and people waiting in line to get the Moderna vaccine. It, it's great seeing people actually have some hope and relief for the first time. Some of these individuals, they, you could just tell that they were just, they're so, they're so, uh, vulnerable to what this vaccine or what this uh, virus is doing to their communities. And it was just nice to be in there at that moment. I had to paint it and I'll be back there um, in a couple of weeks to paint some more and just document this. These are nurses that and doctors preparing the vaccine uh, through the doorway. I got a glimpse of that. And I, this book, this project, the first book was the confusion and the increased increase of the virus spreading. And the second book I'm hoping is going to be a documentation of how we're going to get out of this. So Daniel the, the is normal, hopefully right. A new normal, perhaps of some sort. So do you want me to start talking a little bit about FEMA? Yeah, FEMA? please. Well, let me just do a little, um, you know, a precursor that I don't uh, officially uh, speak for FEMA as an agency, even though I work there. These are just my personal uh, ideas and recommendations and, and from what I see. I'm on a call, uh, conference calls all week, con uh, interagency conference calls. So I, I know a little bit about what's going on, but I'm not an official FEMA, FEMA spokesperson. But FEMA, like most federal agencies, are divided into 10 regions. Uh, uh, Alex is up in region 10 and Eddie is in region nine. I don't know where Roger and Cecily are from, but uh, you're there somewhere. Uh, but uh, ever since the administration, it's night and day. We now have a clear focus. We are really going all out uh, to work with our partners, uh, the Health and Human Services, the Center for Disease Control, Johns Hopkins, uh, the National Guard, you name it, we're working with them. Department of, uh, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Energy, trying to get the vaccines distributed and inoculated into people's arms. So uh, the president has given us two tasks, one within 30 days of the administration, uh, of the inauguration to set up 100 federal, federal vaccine sites supported by FEMA, and two, to get at least a million, a hundred million people vaccinated within a hundred days of the inauguration, about three and a half months from January. The good news is uh, we're well, we're ahead of the hundred million people being vaccinated within a hundred days. We're trying to push for 1.5 million and maybe even 2 million. Uh, the Biden administration has provided a lot more uh, funding. Uh, we're working with clear focus now. We're There's really- uh, There's not, it, was, it, it wasn't, what was it like before? It was, what was it like before in the pre previous administration? Well, that's a good question, Alex. I mean, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we were really busy trying well, to get people. Uh, we, we, because we, from the news reports, it seems like it was a shit show. So like, you know, you don't have to say, you don't have to say anything, but I could say it. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you have to be politically correct, but, um, well, no, I mean, we were doing our best with what we had, but exactly. it, yeah. it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't as clear and focused as it is now. And uh, I think a lot, that, lot, a lot of that has to do with the vaccines coming on board. I yep. mean, before we were just trying to get PPE out and trying to get the messaging out that people needed to be uh, wear masks and do social distancing and wash your hands. And really, if you have a cold, don't go to work, that, those kind of things. Now that the vaccine is out, we really need to push and I know not everyone's gonna take the vaccine and that's people's choice. And I think that uh, it's really important that people 
make an educated choice for themselves right. on whether to take the vaccine or not. But we're really, uh, we're hoping that if we can get 70 to 80% of the people in the country vaccinated by summer or fall, we can probably beat this thing and even the, the different strains that are coming out. And da, 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 this afternoon, you can't see it, but I got my first vaccine. I got the Pfizer vaccine. It's my right. CDC card. What we're doing at FEMA, all of us can be deployed at any time. And I was talking to my boss the other day, I'll probably get a deployment to maybe one of the vaccine sites we're setting up in March. So it's really important that as many of us at FEMA and DHS and HHS and CDC get vaccinated as soon as possible. So I was up at the Veterans Administration Hospital uh, earlier today getting my shot and I'll get my second one on February 27th. But uh, it was great seeing a lot of the vets, the US vets up there today with me. I was there at one o'clock. I had a one o'clock appointment and by one o'clock they had already processed a thousand uh, shots this morning. How you so feel? We're working like ghost uh, gangbusters. How you feel right now? Good. My arm's a little sore. All right, that's good. I think my, my workout out the gym is, is making me sore, but it's I don't think it's the COVID. That wasn't, yeah, it probably wasn't the vaccine. It was just you know you're pumping weights. Yeah, I did a crazy class this morning. But uh, so, these are um, mm -hmm. I, I would recommend. I, I know Eddie. Uh, I would recommend that people educate themselves by accessing any one of these uh, uh, websites. And just really make a good decision for yourself on whether you should get the vaccine or not. I dropped the links inside the chat. So make sure that you copy them down, click them, that they're open. Don't look at them right now because we're, we're almost done here. So wanted to share the information that we have and do your research. We're also, uh, another important thing that's gonna happen this week that I can tell you, we're really excited. We're going to be uh, sending vaccines directly to 6,500 retail pharmacies so that uh, they don't have to go through the state allocation and the state, uh, you know, the state approval. That's gonna mm -hmm. be really helpful. One of the problems with the current distribution, each state has different regulations. Um, even in terms of who gets the first vaccines or not. And it's just been, it's a real um, challenge uh, delivering the vaccines on time, especially when you have weather conditions like you had in the Northeast this last week with three or four feet of snow. You know, the UPS trucks and the uh, FedEx trucks can't deliver the vaccines. The vaccines have a uh, short shelf life. Uh, and each state has different regulations. And mm -hmm. data collection uh, has been a challenge. Can you imagine trying to get data from every hospital, pharmacy, clinic? Uh, right. It's pretty challenging. And we're also trying uh, really hard to reach underserved populations, especially the Navajo Nation uh, in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. They cover a huge area. Uh, uh, towns like Chinle and Shiprock, we really tried to set up special uh, clinics there for the people. And uh, you know, we're really trying hard to, to, to reach as many uh, of the underserved populations as possible. For example, in Missouri, which is a very rural state, we have 27 pop-up sites. These pop-up sites can be in a, in a parking lot for a few hours. And then the next day they're in another parking lot for a few hours. So the people don't have to travel if we can get to those rural communities and get the vaccines out. So again, we're really trying hard on all sorts of accounts. And I, I just hope the American people understand that, um, but we're, we'll get there. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear that new information about private retail. That's um, like you said, all that work that you're doing, how, how big is the team at FEMA working on this? How many people are well, virtually every department is on alert. Uh, we have about in the uh, national uh, 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 the NRCC, it's called. We have about 80 people working seven days a week just on coordinating calls and, and getting um, you know supplies here and there. And then we have daily check-in calls 8:30 every morning, and then we have about four or five interagency uh, calls during the week, and then we have a call with the White House every morning at 10 o'clock. That we get a lot of good information on. So, so would you say like a thousand people? 
Yeah, Overall. and then there's going to be more as we start uh, setting up these uh, these uh, vaccine clinics. Uh, we're also like trying to set up mega oh. clinics. There's going to be one in Oakland, uh, set mm -hmm. up at the Oakland Coliseum, and there's yeah, going to be one you know that up is. in Los Angeles. And I know oh, wow. my uncle. I know my uncle who's 95 years old and lives in uh, Eagle Rock, California, which is near Glendale, Pasadena. He got his shot at Dodger Stadium, and I'm a big Dodger fan. You can see my Dodger mm -hmm. cup here. So I am just so jealous that he got his shot at Dodger Stadium. I would have loved to have been there at Dodger Stadium. <laughs> well, I'm sure you can get in that stadium, so. <laughs> That's a good point, you know, it's the saying like, you know, for voting, you know, you know, there's infrastructure already put in place for that. Like there's machines, all this stuff has been planned ahead. But you know, this vaccine, this is like these pop-up sites this is brand new. This is like, and you know, because you had so much direction from the last administration, you know, you're, you're kind of starting now. So, you know, you guys got, it's, it's a daunting task, but uh, I'm glad you're on it, you know, like, so it makes me feel better, you know? Oh, thank you. So, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's the monumental task because like, you know, just those voting centers, you know, they've been voting centers for, you know, decades or, you know, years, but you know, these pop-up clinics, you know, you're right. There's a lot of places, they don't have pharmacists. So, you know, very in the middle of part of the country, it's, you know, you gotta make something up there. So. And even in, uh, I know I can share one, one other tidbit in Colorado, we're trying to link up with the people who need dialysis on a regular basis. Right. And if they come into town for the di their dialysis treatments, we're trying to uh, at least get them tested and maybe vaccinated at the same time so they don't have to uh, keep going back and forth. So again, those little nuances are just um, just amazing. I mean, we could talk for hours about what we're doing with schools and um, uh, uh, long-term care facilities. We're really doing well of vaccinating people in long-term care facilities. That's well, did really you have a f did you have a few minutes to stay after the presentation just to sure. tell talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, because I'd love to hear about that. Uh, and since we're coming to this to a close. Uh, we're not going to go into a full in-depth presentation about the rest of the book, but Alex and I just wanted to tell you that all the paintings that you just saw before with the uh, voting, um, it's just like a tiny piece of what this project involved. The election had so many moving parts. It had so many people, protests, voices, election centers, people that were volunteering, people that were just concerned, people, uh, media, photographers such a wide breadth of people from all over the nation and in all over the world came to Washington, D.C. during the election. And um, we, we had just had such a powerful um, um, experience in a project that was put together. I'm going to drop in the links for you to pre-order the uh, pandemic books and then the link to the election 2020 book, which is ready to print. Now, those of you who uh, pre-purchased this on the Kickstarter will have these signed and numbered. And because they are signed and numbered and we are waiting for them from the printers, it was, it's gonna take a little bit more time. So please be patient with us. We're, um, right now, COVID is affecting the printing presses and the book um, binding process. So we're hoping to make sure that um, anything that gets to us will get to you as fast as possible. Make sure that you check your email to see uh, a request about your shipping address. And in the meantime, also check out the rest of my artwork um, through the, the pandemic. And that are also, Alex and I are also on social media. This is a quick map of all the different places, we're not gonna get into it, but as you can tell, like we were pretty active and went all over Washington, DC. There will be one final last episode of the book release, and this will be focused on artivism, which is a combination of art and activism. Is and that a word that you made up or? No, no, it's actually a real word. It's a word that I learned okay. while during the painting during the protests uh, last summer. Okay. Um, and just at protests, people walked up to me and said, oh, you're doing art of it. I was like, what's that? You know, like, yeah, I've never heard of that and, story. and, and people who are at protests, they express themselves in different ways. And in this case, this specific talk is going to be about protest art. Three women who were at 
the uh, Trump fence outside the White House. They were there for months, months, creating artwork, creating signs, putting them up. This is one of the Nadin. Uh, she wants to be on the call. She's holding up the f flag, upside down flag, American flag, which is a, a, is a sign of distress. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is close to Black Lives Matter. There are tons of police that evening. Down below is a painting of that moment. Um, I'm standing uh, a little bit further to the right of that photo. Alex is on the lower right. He's taking photographs down there. I've, I painted him taking photographs. And yeah, people, that's going to be a really, really a big one. So uh, right now I'm getting the date for it and the time because there's multiple people involved. There's a lot of production involved. And uh, yeah, please join us for that. You're not going to want to miss it because, you know, every day we spent at those voting booths at night, we were back out uh, on a Black Lives Matter Plaza documenting. Ed was documenting and drawing. We we're shooting cool photos. So it's going to be a great presentation. Uh, we're looking forward to like showing it to y'all. And because all of you are here offering free shipping until the end of February using the checkout code DC2020. What? Oh, you wow. can, and you can find all of the books at edisu.com. This is not just for the election book, for all of any books that you purchase through um, the site. And there is a video documentary that is currently in the works that I'm helping put together, that I'm putting together and other people. Um, I'm hoping to get some help. If any of you have videography experience, please let me know and love to collaborate with you on something. Also, social media. I'm going to drop in my link for the newsletter. This is one of the best ways to keep updated on what I'm working on project-wise. This will go directly to your email box. I'm not gonna spam you or sell your information to anybody else. I take care of everything in my own business. So I run the website, I run this email list. So this is not going to anywhere else. I'm also starting a YouTube channel. So at edisu.art. Um, once you get there, there's gonna be more and more video clips. And as the documentary is being put together, I'm gonna to put more stuff up there. Um, I'm really getting into videography as a means of telling a story that helps support these paintings. And of course, Instagram has stories and short, short form videos. Check us out there. Alex is up there as well. We're on Facebook. And Stop we on by. Really cool videos, so that we didn't get to. So hopefully we'll get to it at our next episode. But yeah, we we we're, we're just scratching the surface of what we showed today. So yeah, as you can see, there's you know there's a GoPro strapped to my chest over there. So there's footage from that first person view is of me painting. There's there's we brought equipment, mobile video equipment that we you know not anything fancy, but stuff to get it done time lapses so we'll have more art and more video for you all of you and come join us next time and thanks for coming again